Well, thanks for doing this. It's a pleasure. Sure. Uh, I'd like to start off at the beginning. Uh, I heard the story that uh, you became first interested in Lincoln in the sixth grade. How did, is, that, is that the way it started? You're much younger than I am, so they may not have done this to you when you were in elementary school, but we would be seated alphabetically, last name, Williams, last row, last seat. I sat under this very formidable portrait of Abraham Lincoln, but I liked his face. And my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Taylor, as good teachers do everywhere, uh, saw my interest and she, she encouraged me to study Lincoln. That's how I started. I read that you, you took your lunch money and started buying books. I did. I did, 25 cents a day in the 50s. And we had many more used bookstores then than we do now. And I would take the bus at the end of my street in Cranston, Rhode Island, and go down into Providence at Broad Street, where all the used bookstores were, and I would buy what I could, uh, many of them uh, paperback, like Carl Sandburg's uh, abridged war years and prairie years, and Dale Carnegie's biography of Lincoln that he would give to uh, registrants to his public speaking courses. It wasn't a very good biography of Lincoln, but it was a beginning for me. Did the serious collecting begin at that point? I would say that was the germ, the nucleus, the genesis of doing it, and to the extent I could buy books which I love. That's my first love, books, paper. Despite the internet, it's still the book that, that is, I think, important. And I think um, there was an interregnum when I went to undergraduate school at Boston University. Some purchases when I was in the Army for almost five years in Germany and Southeast Asia. And then when I separated from the service in 67 and went to law school, also at BU, that's when the real serious collecting started. Where did you go? The, the, the stories that I hear you know, from most collectors, well, I, I go to bookstores, you, and you never know where things are going to turn out. That's right. And, and I'm married to a Texan. She never lets me forget it, but she's been very supportive of this. That's why we call it the Frank and Virginia Williams Collection of Lincolniana. And she would scout out bookstores and antique stores because it's not just the books and pamphlets that we collect, but the ephemera, the three-dimensional objects. And she was very helpful in that regard. Well, you start with every new book that comes out. That's a beginning. Then you go to used bookstores. You begin to check off Monaghan, which is the bibliography that was published in 1939. And you, you get to be very serious when you use a Monaghan number and try to find the pamphlet or book that it represents. What about authors? Who are your favorites? Sandberg, of course, wrote the... Well, my favorites are Richard Nelson Current, who's in his 90s now and in a, in a um, uh, care facility in, outside of Boston. Uh, I think he's great. David Donald, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Harold Holzer, uh, the the uh, peop Eric Foner, who, who just edited a wonderful book of essays called Our Lincoln. He's done great work on Reconstruction and Emancipation. There are so many. Ron White, who I think, uh, I think his new biography uh, of Lincoln, just out uh, in January of '09, is right up there with Stephen B. Oates's, with Malice Toward None, Benjamin Thomas's. Abraham Lincoln, a biography, David Donald's uh, Lincoln. Uh, I think it's right, it's right. So there are so many that, that are in the Lincoln field. You know, Jack, um, uh, I'm doing an annotated bibliography of Lincoln for SIU Press. And uh, this is 16,000 books and pamphlets since, Lincoln, uh, since Lincoln's death in 1865. And in the last two years leading up to the bicentennial on February 12, 2009, there, there has been one book a week published on Lincoln. So say 90, I count 90, of which there uh, must be 20 on, uh, for children. And that will continue, I think, through, uh, through 2009. So there's just a plethora of, of Lincoln literature that's coming from the presses.
A lot of your colleagues credit you for being one of the real foot soldiers out there several decades back who was interested in not only collecting Lincoln, but interpreting Lincoln, lecturing on Lincoln, and uh, exposing new generations to uh, Lincoln's legacy. Uh, what does it feel like to have all of this coming out now as we near the bicentennial? Well, there was a time when I was hoping that, that I, would, I, I could survive to, to 2009, that I'd be alive and able to continue the studies and, and collaborate and write and lecture, and that's come to fruition, and for that I'm grateful. I, I think it's a sense of, of practicing what I call the politics of inclusion. Others call it the politics of cohesion, for example, of outreach, which I tried to do as Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. That is to let the citizens that we serve know what the judiciary is about and what it's like. And, and I felt the same way about Abraham Lincoln, getting the word out. And it's not just the objects, and you alluded to this, it's not just the collecting, the material things, it's what they represent. It, it puts a face on the man and his era, our middle period of American history. There's something about actually being able to put your fingers on something, to actually pick up something that either he, he owned or someone who was with him that's contemporaneous with him. That's right, and, and it's very important because it, it does a couple of things. One is it puts us in the context of his times. And I think if we, if we can be faulted for anything as an American civilization is that we're too quick to judge by today's standards, not by the times in which these historical characters lived, uh, were in pain, were elated, were productive, had their failures, had their successes, just like we do today. And, and I think we need to understand that as a culture. Yeah, there's a tendency to do revisionist history. Exactly, or a knee-jerk reaction, it's all good, it's all bad, and there's no modicum, there's no 40-yard uh, line or uh, the centrist or, or trying to balance the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to go back for a second. You, you also had, in addition to an early interest in Lincoln, you had an early interest in the law. Yes. Were they, was that interest in the law uh, in some ways influenced by Lincoln? Uh, totally influenced by Lincoln. I started in the sixth grade. I go to junior high school, now called middle school, 13. I decide then I want to be a lawyer because Lincoln was a very good lawyer. And that's what, I had really no idea what the practice was like, except anecdotally, and just a good feeling about it because of Lincoln's persona. And that never, that never uh, stopped. One of the things that, uh, uh, in reading Judging Lincoln, your, your book of uh, essays, uh, I had always thought of Lincoln as being the lawyer first and then the politician later, but I, it's, it's actually the other way around. Could you speak to that? Well, as you said, he, he ran for political office before he studied law, and he tried many other occupations in New Salem. And that, I think, fed off each other. The, the law, he was, in, he was encouraged to study law, no law schools in, in Illinois at the time, uh, by Stuart, with whom he served in the Black Hawk War. And Lincoln would have been happy or thought for a while of being a blacksmith, which is a very noble profession. He didn't think that he had the intellect to really uh, uh, study. He was self-taught, as we know, with less than one year's schooling in blab schools in southern Indiana. And uh, he did read law and was admitted in 1837 to the bar of Illinois. And when he practiced, I mean, just think about it, the, the symmetry. He'd go to uh, three months in the spring and three months in the fall on the old Eighth Judicial Circuit from county seat to county seat with, with terrible living conditions. But he was not just practicing law for his clients, but he was doing precinct work as a Whig politician, which was his party at the time. So they fed off each other. And I think this helped his ability to communicate, to convince juries, uh, to, um, to press forward with a political agenda uh, on, uh, on, uh, for the Whig party and then later the Republican party. But he was, uh, in the, what, the 24 years that he actually practiced law, he had something like was it 5,000 Over 5,000 cases. And over 300 before the Illinois Supreme Correct. Court. 
He would have been an historic lawyer in his own right. Yes, I think so. Some have deprecated his law practice, thinking he, he was a good lawyer, uh, which is fine. You know, I, I hoped that I was a good lawyer in my 25-year practice. But he was something more. He, he, he was a lawyer's lawyer. This is why people like Ward Hill Lehman, his friend in Danville, uh, would refer cases to him when he came there. And other lawyers would wait for his arrival because he could understand complex issues. And the, juror, the jurors liked him and the judges trusted him. So he had this ability to communicate, which he carried into the, the White House or the executive mansion, as, as it was called then. They, don't, they didn't teach law in the 1800s like they taught you in Boston. Uh, and he, he read the law, uh, but there was no form, formal training in elocution, no uh, formal training in doing interrogatories and so on. That's right. It was on the job training because he began his practice with Stuart, the same one who encouraged him to study the law. Then he, then he practiced with uh, Stephen Logan, who was, who was a, a really fine, brilliant lawyer. And that's where Lincoln learned the art of pleadings and how concise and succinct and technical they had to be because the case could be thrown out if you didn't dot an I or cross a T. And that helped his discipline. And then uh, when Logan wanted to take in his son, Lincoln takes in William Herndon, Billy Herndon, his last law partner, and becomes a mentor to, to Billy Herndon. So it's all that evolving. And that was another great thing about Lincoln is he evolved, he was able to change, he grew, not only as a lawyer and politician in Illinois, but in the White House. How did his legal technique or his law, his knowledge of the law and how the law was constructed, how it was discerned and argued, how did that assist him in his political career? I think it was uh, instrumental in him and his being such a fine politician, if not brilliant. And he was, uh, he was so good at, at the practice of law and at dealing with people that he was persuasive and convincing and people uh, would come to him and trusted him, whether it was to represent them in a case, whether it was to have him mediate a case. He was a big believer in alternative dispute resolution long before that phrase was, was invented, mediation, or having the parties resolve their, their differences without the ordeal of, of a courtroom. Going all the way back to King Solomon. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. How did, uh, you, you wrote in your book about how, how Lincoln's uh, abilities as a lawyer, how the questioning, doing the interrogatories, served him in working with his generals. Yes. How did that work? Well, he was the lawyer in the White House. Let's, let's not uh, kid ourselves. Uh, people will cite his lack of public service or lack of experience to become president. But all of those years on the circuit of practicing in Springfield before the U.S. District Court or the state courts all were part of his training because it's the tedium, it's the loneliness of command, I call it, the leadership, uh, the ability to communicate that, that he learned. All of, him, all of that stood him in, in, in good shape when, when he did become the president. And he used it. He used it. For example, when General McClellan wanted to uh, go to the peninsula and attack Richmond from the south, leaving Washington by itself in a way, Lincoln was concerned about that, the protection of the nation's capital and whether or not McClellan would be more effective coming from the south on the peninsula to attack General Johnson's army rather than the direct approach over land. So what Lincoln did was he made um, several interrogatory questions to McClellan. Why is your plan any better than mine? And then he would go right down, forcing this commanding general of the Army of the Potomac to respond. McClellan didn't have a lot of respect for, for uh, President Lincoln. He thought he was a doofus or lacked experience. And it was really the other way around. McClellan was a lot of show and very little go. Describe the chemistry between Lincoln and another famous Illinoisan, Ulysses Grant. How did it work? Well, just as Lincoln evolved 
with his leadership in the White House. Grant evolved in his leadership as a general. Remember, uh, he was not in the military at the beginning of the war. He assisted uh, the, ad the Illinois Adjutant General because of his West Point training and his service in the Mexican War. Then took over the 20th Illinois in Mattoon, which was a pretty rowdy outfit, and disciplined them. Engaged in the battle at Belmont, where he learned really that the enemy was just as afraid of him as he was afraid of, he and his troops were afraid of them. And then, of course, comes Forts Henry and Donaldson. Now, now Lincoln sees someone in the West who knew how to fight. And then Shiloh, where he almost, where Grant almost lost the battle um, on the first day, but tells Sherman, his friend, that's all right. This is the night of the first day, the raining, terrible casualties. We'll whip them tomorrow. Lincoln liked that. So as he's evolving with Vicksburg uh, and Lincoln's watching this, so by the time Lincoln appoints a general in chief, it, there was no question. It had to be Grant. They got along Grant's taciturn ma manner, uh, no bloviating, no false optimism. Uh, that, that impressed Lincoln, and he came to trust him. And it was the beginnings of the, of the modern um, joint command staff, a commander-in-chief who set policy, Lincoln, a general-in-chief who would be in charge of all the, the armies and movements uh, tied in with the Navy, and a chief of staff, which was Henry Halleck then, rather, you know, almost like a military secretary. But it was the beginning of, of our modern, of, of our modern day uh, military protocol. I want to go back to something you touched upon a little bit earlier about some of the ways that, the lenses that we look at history and historical figures from today's point of view. Lincoln, of course, is seen as the great emancipator and all. But at the same time, during the war, he had to make very difficult decisions based on the realities he was facing. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He had something like, what, four or 5,000 military tribunals of American citizens and, and so forth. Uh, but that's very disturbing to the modern day reader about the kinds of things uh, that he felt compelled to do. Lincoln believed, and he was a lawyer, and he believed in our Constitution and practiced it. He believed in the Declaration of Independence and its vision even more so, which predated the Constitution. But he believed in wartime that the war gave the commander-in-chief the law of war, as with emancipation. Uh, the, the slaves were property. In wartime, you can seize the property of the enemy. So I'm going to seize the property. And that's why the Emancipation Proclamation, the final one on January 1, 1863, was couched as a war measure. You write that Lincoln, the lawyer, was very careful about the way that the Emancipation Proclamation was written, that, that he wanted to make sure that it would uh, hold up to uh, future the appeals process. That's something you know very well, inside and out. Speak to that. That's, he still worried, even though he had a great rationale for issuing this as a war measure, along with his personal feelings that every man uh, should be free. Uh, he was concerned that, that the Tawney Court, remember, Roger Tawney was still the Chief Justice until he died in 1864. He was afraid, you know, he worried about the votes on the, on the court and the Chief Justice, who did not appreciate Lincoln's idea of presidential leadership. As he, as he disagreed with Lincoln when he authorized the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus uh, along the rail line from Washington to Philadelphia after the firing on Fort Sumter, the capital was surrounded by Virginia that it was, had gone south, Maryland that was very close to going uh, to the Confederate States. So this is why Lincoln felt he could do certain things in wartime that he could not do in peacetime. Plus the Constitution permitted the suspension of habeas corpus in cases of rebellion or invasion when the public safety require it. There is a lot of speculation about how Reconstruction would have been crafted, how it, would have, how it might have evolved had Lincoln, had Lincoln lived. Do you have a, an informed idea? Well, it's difficult to speculate, Jack. Uh, lawyers and judges, I, I don't think, like to speculate. But it, ha it would have had to have been better than under Andrew Johnson. He, you, you have a leader here, Lincoln, who was pragmatic. 
and had a vision. And uh, he, he had trouble even with no Southern delegations in the Congress. He had trouble with his own Republicans, the radical Republicans, who didn't think he moved fast enough or fired enough generals soon enough. But he was able to moderate this and, and stay just, uh, just a, a bit ahead of them and, and communicate his vision and, and objectives. And, and I think he would have done that uh, after, after the, end of, the end of the Civil War. Another what if question, but we're, we're just a few blocks away from where Lincoln practiced, where Lincoln uh, was arguing on the floor of the Illinois House of Representatives in the old state capitol. That very state capitol was the launching pad for Barack Obama's presidential bid, and Barack Obama has hearkened back to Lincoln's legacy many, many times over the years. Uh, why does this president still speak to us after all these many years? because he's part of us. He, he is what we see in ourselves or what we would like to be. And I think we carry Lincoln around, every one of us, every school child, adult, public official, judge, is just beneath, the, just beneath the surface of our skin. And I think we want to um, follow him, even though we have to be our own people, just as President Obama is going to have to make his own way with difficult and perhaps even more challenging problems than Abraham Lincoln had during, during the Civil War. What do you think about Obama's uh, using the Lincoln legacy in the way he has? He's invoked it here on the Capitol steps a few blocks away, all the way to making that symbolic train ride into Washington. It's a good beginning. I think he had uh, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals under his arm, which was cabinet building, bringing in political rivals or members from the other party, which he's done. Uh, I think, I think, and he's going to have to see this firsthand, probably already has in the first 24 hours of his presidency, that to be prepared for the unexpected, that there'll be problems that you can never anticipate, and to be pragmatic. He's got some basic qualities that I think will help him that are Lincoln-esque. He's cool, he's generally cool under fire calm. Now maybe he acquired that, this is the current president, in peaceful Hawaii uh, because that's their, that's their environment, that's their milieu. Uh, and I, I, know, I, I noticed this and I think it's a good thing because he's going to have to be very, very cool under the challenges that, that, he's, that he and our nation and the global village are, are facing right now. I covered him as a state senator in Illinois. And he's not easily rattled. And that's important. That is important. When, 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 in, in, and we've got so many issues: global warming, um, the terrorists um, who want to kill us and destroy us. They make no bones about it. Uh, current conflicts, uh, our engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan, other hostilities by other countries that that will affect us and the rest of the world, genocide. Just think of the economy in, in, a, in an economy that's in the soup. I mean, just think of the, uh, the overwhelming challenges that, that he's confronting. So he's going to have to be cool under fire. I can't end this without asking you as a sitting judge uh, how Lincoln's legal writings have influenced you. Do you have they you know, come up in, in your thoughts as you've considered cases and the decisions you've had to render? Every day, uh, be succinct. Less is more. Make it clear to the lowest common denominator of what you're doing and why so that everyone understands the rationale. Communicate. People come. They trust you when you tell them the truth. One of the fellow laureates, Carl Dean, who was inducted with you here in the last uh, few hours, made the comment, and I found this just wo a wonderful synopsis, and it goes back to what you were saying. He said, Lincoln was not afraid to tell the truth to the common person because the idea was that if you told the common person the truth, they would eventually do the right thing. And, and Jack, that's true. I've seen it as Chief Justice. They get it. The people get it. If, if, your, if your paradigm, which was mine as, as a judge, is to serve the citizens, we're not there to serve the other judges or the lawyers. 
we're there to serve the people. If, if they hear this and they see it, they get it. You have a distinguished career on the bench and of course as one of the most noted Lincoln historians of our age. To be on the dais last night and to be conferred the Order of Lincoln Medallion, what was going through your mind? How, um, how overwhelming the experience was to be in Lincoln's hometown and to be recognized by the Lincoln Academy when heretofore they've, and, and understandably so, recognized Illinoisans and to be a non-Illinoisan, to be welcomed into the family. It was very Lincoln-esque because we all try, at least I try, to consider our community a family. Final question, and that has to do with your being a member of the Bicentennial Commission. We have so, this seems to be not so much a national uh, celebration, but a celebration of all the various states. Is that a good way to look at it? I think that's very true, and I think there's a reason for that, uh, several reasons. One is the budget, of course. You, you, the ALBC in Washington c could not really, we thought of it initially, could not really support financially everything that should be done or considered to be done for Lincoln's 200th birthday. And what pleases me so much is that, that many states, most of the states, have picked up the cudgel and developed their own program, even Rhode Island, my state, and of course Illinois and the Lincoln states of Kentucky and Indiana uh, and the District of Columbia, all have, all have stepped up and we've coordinated and liaisoned and, and everything else that you can do. That's all part of this community family spirit that we were talking about a minute ago. Justice Williams, thank you so much. Thanks very much for having me and for doing this.